dedicated to each and every one of you who appreciate a great glass of wine. You know what I mean? It's Monday. Let's raise a glass to the beginning of another week. It's time to unscrew, uncork, or savor a bubble. And let's begin exploring the wine glass. Welcome to Wine for Bet Street. Today, the letter of the day is S, and it stands for San Marco. Have you ever heard of this grape? Have you tasted it? This was a brand new variety to me, and I was so intrigued to learn more, and then so impressed once I tasted it. In fact, I took a bottle to an event filled with wine professionals, and it was the hit of the evening. We had the pleasure of interviewing Jim Correa and Larry Coya from Bellevue Winery in New Jersey. These are the guys not only responsible for bringing the vines to the United States, but for naming the variety. While you're listening, it would be greatly appreciated if you could take one minute to subscribe, rate, and review. It takes only a few seconds of your time, but means so much to the show. Next best way to support Exploring the Wine Glass is to tell your friends, because if you love the podcast, your wine-loving friends will too. Follow me on all the socials, and finally, don't forget to head to the website, exploringthewineglass.com, to read the blog, sign up for the newsletter, and keep up on everything happening. Slancha! Hey everybody, I'm Lori Budd, a UC Davis winemaking program, Spanish wine scholar, Somme Day service, champagne and Cote de Ron specialist, and a WSET level 2 graduate. You can find Exploring the Wine Glass on all the socials, as well as your favorite podcast catchers. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's the perfect time to swipe, subscribe, rate, and review. Stay in the know about all things wine by visiting my website, exploringthewineglass.com. I promise I'll never tell you what to drink, but I'll always share what's in my glass. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wine for That Street. We hope you are enjoying your summer thus far and surviving the heat that is everywhere. But um, here on Wine for the Street, this is where the cool kids are because we have guest sponsors of Bellevue Winery from New Jersey, and we are talking San Marco. So I have to admit, I had never had this great before, so I'm super, super excited to uh, learn all about this. And uh, as we get into it, just as a little reminder or a new thing, if you are new to Wine for That Street, I am your co-host, Lori. I am a co-owner with my husband, Dracina Wine in Casa Robles. I have a WSET Level 2 Champagne Specialist, um, uh, the Cote de Rhone specialist and a Spanish wine scholar, as well as a UC Davis winemaking program graduate. And uh, we are excited to try this San Marco. And my co host is Deb. I'm Debbie Giaquindo, and I have to admit, I've cheated because back in 2020, I was on a New Jersey media trip, and it was the only, I think, wine media trip during COVID. And that's where I learned about the San Marco grape. <laughs> so, when we, so when we came up to S, that's why I said, oh, San Marco. And Lori's like, I've never heard of that. I go, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> so I am known as the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess. I am a certified specialist of wine, a wine location specialist in port and champagne, and a certified specialist, certified sherry wine specialist. I'm a chairperson for the Hudson Valley Wine Competition. I'm author of the book, Tapping the Hudson Valley, Day Trips and Weekend Itineraries, Visiting the Hudson Valley Wine Region. And in the summer, you can find me chained to Trio North Wildwood, um, our restaurant in North Wildwood, New Jersey. So you can come down and visit me there. Um, that's where I spend six out of seven days of the week. And the uh, best times to visit are any day but Friday and Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> the most crowded. So, um, Jim and Larry, do you want to introduce yourselves a little bit? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll start. Uh, I'm Jim Carella, uh, Bellevue Winery. I'm actually fourth generation here on Bellevue Farms. Uh, the property was bought back here back in 1914 by my great grandparents. 
Uh, we were a vegetable farm until 2000 when my wife Nancy and I decided to switch and start growing grape and making wine commercially. Uh, so that's when we started Bellevue Winery. Uh, so when the first three acres were planted, that was after 2000 was our first vintage. Um, and that's just a little bit about me. And then Larry and Barb Coya, I'll just turn it over to Larry. He came in. Well, I should back up a little bit. Larry and I have been partners since I got into the grape business. Um, we bought equipment together. We formed the Outer Coastal Plain Vineyard Association together. Uh, we uh, got our AVA, the Outer Coastal Plain AVA, approved through the federal uh, TTB or was a TTB at that yeah. time. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this is Larry Coya. So I've been growing grapes since 76, uh, including some vinifera. I, uh, I was, I'm a retired radiation oncologist, and in 2006, Jim helped me uh, plant uh, five acres of uh, uh, red varieties of Chambersan, Cabernet Franc, and uh, Cab Sauvignon. And then uh, I retired completely in 2013 and have been growing grapes ever since with my son, not too far from here in East Vineland, New Jersey, about three or four miles away. And then um, my wife and I bought into the winery with Jim a couple years ago, Jim and Nancy. So um, co-owner of Bellevue with Jim. Hey, wonderful. Oh, that's All right. great. Vineland, that, they yeah. have a great Jim team. So that pretty much, you know, explains how the two of you became partners through just a long-term relationship. Right. That, yeah. How did you officially meet them? Well, probably, I think it was one of our relatives. <laughs> it was my great aunt Ada, and um, who is, she was born, well, was she born here? Yes, she was born right here on this farm. And the farm behind us was uh, Larry's mom's family. So ah. once they knew that we grew great, they, we had a, they had to make the introduction, and that's where it started. <laughs> so that was around 2000. It's about 20, 24 years ago. Yeah, wow, well, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So, go, go to three, Deb. Okay. So um, how did you become involved with the San Marco Great? Because, you know. Oh, actually, you, though, Deb, we forgot, yeah. um, we forgot Elmo. Oh, we forgot Elmo. We forgot Elmo. So we're going to oh, take a we're going to do our little intro video and I'm dying to clink. So we're going to okay. do our video and then um, we will clink and then we'll get into the questions. Okay. We start with A, B, C and we go all the way to C. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, Y, Z, now I know my ABCs, next time won't you sing with me? Each ladder makes a sound, let's sound them out now. We start with ABC and we go all the way to C. That's nice. That is intense. Yeah. yeah. So how did Bellevue Winery get involved in the San Marco Great? Um, so, as we said, you know, Larry became partners in the, in the winery and a couple of years ago, but we've been working together for years. So Larry, I'm going to let Larry tell you about his trip over to Italy and how this all came about. So would you like to hear a little history about the San Marco? Oh, yes. yes. Okay. Yes. So <laughs> we formed this Outer Coastal Plain Vineyard Association after we got the uh, AVA, the Outer Coastal Plain AVA approved around 2007. We got grants. Uh, we saw that, uh, there were some similarities between our growing area and two regions in particular in Europe. One was Bordeaux, and I have to say a plug, even though we're drinking San Marco from Italy, we had a famous professor from Bordeaux come and visit our vineyards back in 2010. And the word is that if he were to plant Bordeaux varieties anywhere outside of Bordeaux, it would be Southern New Jersey in the outer coastal plains because we have so many similarities. But we're not talking about Bordeaux today. We're talking about the other region that we identified, and that was the Trentino Alto Adige region 
of uh, northern Italy. It is uh, some of the coldest weather in Italy in the wintertime and some of the hottest weather in Italy in the summertime. Not too dissimilar from what we see in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, and their extremes aren't that extreme. They're, I mean, we don't have 100 degree weather. They don't have 100 degree weather. Uh, they don't have many days where it would be below zero degrees Fahrenheit uh, in the wintertime. So there are a lot of similarities between our climate and even our soil, even though it's mountainous there. In 2011, I visited uh, Verona and made contact with Marco Stefanini, who is a, he's sort of a, um, he's a researcher developing different varieties of grapes for Italians. And he had developed a number of grapes in the 90s, including this grape, which we call San Marco, in the mid 90s. And even though it was 25 years later, Italians didn't have a big interest in it. There were a few places that had planted it and said, hey, this is pr very promising, but they have to go through a lot of red tape to get things accepted. And so I tried the wine. I heard that it was very productive. I heard that uh, somewhat disease resistant. It's totally disease resistant to Botrytis. So I said, could we bring these to the United States, you know, form a, 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 a relation, business relationship? And that's the background of it. Subsequently, you know, we got them imported through California. They spent a couple years in quarantine. They were then released to us in Rutgers. And then we sent them to a nursery in New York State, AA, that would propagate them for us. We've been growing them here for about nine years, since 2015. And um, Bellevue is the only one who's made vintages so far. We've got 2020, 21, 22, 23, and 24 is to come. So this will be our fifth vintage. So you were the first person or the first winery vineyard to cultivate the San Marco in the United States, correct? Yeah, that would be our our uh, vineyard and, and Rutgers. Uh, subsequently, there's three or four that came on uh, within two or three years. Now there's probably 10 in New Jersey, but there's also one in Delaware, uh, one in Maryland, one in uh, North Carolina, maybe, actually maybe two in North Carolina. Really? People request as far away as Georgia. But these, it's going to take them some time to, to you know, develop uh, the wine from it. Obviously, it takes three or four years just for the first uh, grapes to come out to produce a vintage. Well, that's interesting. Yes. And, like, so in terms of the history of the grape itself, uh, you just said you met um, the guy who created this, who crossed, yes. the, who crossed them. Um, so the, how, how cool is that? I want to I want to the grape. I want to do that. Um, I want to create one. But um, how? What is the history like? Why did he decide he wanted to cross it? Um, to cross those two, and like, what? What was he thinking about as he was doing this? Well, again, his name is Marco Stefanini, and uh, he does traditional techniques where he takes the pollen and fertilizes the ovary. Uh, you know, very slow, pain take, painstaking. From that, you get this, the seeds, you plant that, you get tons of different varieties just from those crossings. And then he plants those and decides which ones might be productive, good for the climate, somewhat disease resistant, et cetera. And so it, it took many years for these to be developed. And as I said, when I went there, it was 20 years after that it had been developed. And the Italians were just starting to you know, look at this as a possible variety. But you have to remember, Italians have over 400 native varieties in Italy, so they didn't really need another variety. <laughs> but it's always good to look for, you know, especially with climate change, et cetera, to look for varieties that might, you know, withstand the heat more, cost less to take care of. And, you know, frankly, we are the only ones that call this San Marco. The Italians don't call this San Marco. They've told us, we wish we can call it as simple a name as San Marco. It's easy to pronounce, but it's still called Echo Iasma Uno, which means it, it's it's a big set of numbers. It's still experimental. There are so it's not on the market in, in Italy. It is like, not on the market as San Marco. Absolutely not. It might be in, like Antonori is growing some. Uh, I think mostly in, in Friuli it's being grown, but some in Tuscany. But it's not on the market as a single variety at all. No, we're the only ones in the world. Is it used for blending? Yes. Yeah, yeah it has excellent color, uh, tannin structure, 
you know, as you can see. Um, so it, it, I would say, like Larry said, that they're not producing it as a bridal, but they're probably growing it there and using it in blends or, or fanciful name wines instead of a bridal. Yeah, because so Marco, actually, you don't hear much about reds from northern Italy, but Toravago and Lagrine are like their two best. So yeah. that's that's the parentage of San Marco is Toravago and Lagrine. Um, so can you can tell us the color? Yeah, go go ahead and tell us what you think the two grapes parents give to yeah. this wine. Oh, what they contributed to this? Yes. Oh, geez. I, I couldn't say specifically. I mean, they it, they, it was a match made in heaven, maybe, something like that. <laughs> How's that? I, I would say maybe <laughs> Lagrine uh, more the tannins and the Toraldigo more the fruit. You know, if you want just general terms. Right, right. <laughs> this is darker than either one of those. In yeah, because we did Lagrine. We yeah. did Lagrine on Wine from that street. And um, it's, it's a much lighter color. Yes. We, we had an international, so-called international wine summit in Atlantic City uh, last month. And we tasted blindly a number of wines, but there were a number of Italian uh, sommeliers who were there, some from Friuli, uh, Venezia Giulia. And uh, we had a little difficulty in a blind testing telling the dis difference between our San Marco and their Rifosco. So there's some similarities to Rifosco. I think there's also some similarities to Syrah. There is a, this Syrah has, a, they're linked backgrounds to the parentage of Syrah in this. I would say the color because the, the rim is very deep purpley-ish, similar to a Syrah. Yeah. See, so the color, the color to me actually reminds me of a Petit Verdot. Mm -hmm. You know, especially the, especially the 2022. Uh, this is this is inky. This you know, yeah. This is this is much no more, different. Yeah. This is like no different than the, to the rim. There is a um a little difference, but yeah. So how would you tell us? I mean, I'm sorry, Deb. I just I want to drink. So I I, 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 want, I want you to describe the tasting profile of the. Yeah. I'm sorry. Say that again. Describe the tasting, the tasting profile. profile. Oh, that's a sommelier's job. Yeah. We just, <laughs> yeah. We just make it good. That's all. <laughs> um, well, we, you know, since we've only have four vintages or so, we're trying not to do a whole lot with it, trying to really let it express itself as, as a bridal and, a, you know, the vineyard. Um, so we don't, oak is real, you know, it's neutral oak. Um, the the 22 had more of a tannin structure, a little little coarser. So we we did do some egg white findings with that, um, but most of the time we're just kind of letting it do its own thing, so we can really see what it does and then work with it from there. I get a lot, a lot of like black cherry in the 21. Mm -hmm. I haven't tasted the 22 yet. Definitely. Definitely dark fruit, um, dark cherry, yes. um, plum. Yeah. One of the things that pleased us a whole lot was that in 2020, we had what we, we don't like to call them bad vintages, but it was uh, a challenge. Yeah, it was a challenging year. Vintage. It was, it was, yeah, it was a challenging year. It, we made, Bellevue made really good wine from it. Uh, and that might be one of them that you might have tasted it because... I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, we were, we were there. Was, yeah. If it was back three or four pre COVID or during COVID, it was probably the 20. 2020. And, you know, yeah. it was a very difficult year. It's a very nice wine. So we're very pleased about that. <laughs> yeah. A lot of reds we didn't bottle that year. We grow over 20 varieties of grape. And fortunately, we do not have to bottle vintage every year. So if it doesn't, if it doesn't make you know, the wine up to our standard, we don't have to bottle it as a varietal. You know, we can blend it and do whatever we need to do with it. Right. But San Marco was one that we didn't have to worry about that. That's Marco fantastic. Stefanini said that uh, 
in a, in a really good year, you can keep it in oak for a longer period of time. And it can be a fine wine as a single variety, not, not necessarily blended. Yeah. Now we'll, we'll focus on making it as a varietal because uh, it'll be one of our signature varietals. varietals. And it's only 12.3% alcohol. So that's, that's nice. It's a nice yeah. lower alcohol. Um, and is this, is this 2021 100%? No, this has a little bit of, uh, the 21 has a little bit of Chamberson in it. So okay. what we do, yeah, now the 22 has Merlot because what we'll do is we'll do blind bench tests to, um, you know, the rattle is straight up, the rattle with a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that, just to see if, if it, uh, another variety can help round it out, complement it. And uh, so the 21 went that direction, the 22, has Merlot, just 10% Merlot in it. Now, would it help lower that doesn't that always have to have something in it. And also, um, yeah, mm -hmm. you're just saying it would uh, help it lower the intensity of the tannin if you felt that those tannins were too gripping in 2022, that Merlot. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Softened it. Yeah. That's and then, like I said, I, we're they're still going to spend several months in, in uh, neutral oak before we bottle that just to help it round out more. And so you mentioned that, you know, New Jersey is so similar to Alto Adige. Um, like what about the soils, the climate, the geographical influences? Because, I mean, you know that Debbie's, you know, in New Jersey and I'm originally from there. So um, I'm familiar with New Jersey, but I, like, to me, the climatics, the influences, the mountains and all of that are very different. And, uh, you know, it's high altitude where you guys are low altitude. And yeah. so how do those things interact with each other? Well, they're, they're, um, they're not growing these on the mountains for the most part. They're growing them okay. mostly along the Po River in the river valley. There are some that are on the hillsides, no question about it. Um, I'm not sure where they ultimately want to plant San Marco. I mean, we saw some on a hillside, but I think there's a lot. We also saw a lot, or, you know, on the, uh, in the, along the not the Po River, the Adige. Yeah, it seems like most of their production is down in the valley. Okay. Uh, was the couple vineyards we saw up, up, you know, with, with a thousand foot up or so, it was more or less somebody had a little piece of property up there and they were planting a few grape on it. Not to, you know, they, that's that's where you're main vineyards were and, and so our growing season and their growing season are about 200 days that's the frost free period where it's you know above 32 degrees um and i said before our winter temperatures and summer temperatures aren't a whole lot different uh rainfall at least annually is about the same maybe we get a little bit more in august uh just like in bordeaux we get more than bordeaux um the soil they have they actually told us sandy loam is what they grow this in, and that's what we have. That and we have a lot of gravel here too, which really helps helps drainage. Drainage, right, right. Interesting. So, yeah, the other thing that really impressed us in the vineyard is its disease resistance. Uh, you know, so downy. it doesn't get moldy or downy. It. Uh, no botrytis. No, no botrytis. We've okay. seen just a little bit of downy when other varieties are just getting loaded with it. Uh, powdery mildew has not been an issue on it. Um, the bunches are loose, very yeah. beautiful, big bunches. Sort of like Syrah. It sort of grows like Syrah. Like, that's why there's no question of okay. the yeah. relationship. So that's that's kind of like what you would relate it to if you had yeah. to relate San Marco to a certain grape. I would say so. So Syrah, Syrah, um, at least here, is like a weed. It's, you know, it, it just grows and grows and grows. Um, so I, what in the vineyard itself, how much tending to the vine do you need? Do you need to do? Are you are you dropping fruit? Are you, you know, green backing? What are, you know? How many times are you passing through? Yeah, they, it grows kind of like Syrah, with, you know, it doesn't grow like Chardonnay straight up in the air. It kind of wants to go where it wants to go. 
Uh, fortunately, with our soils, our, our uh, sandy loam soils, and they dry out quick. So they they only they grow when they get too much. When we get too much rain, then they, the vine grows too much. Um, like a year like this, we hedged once so far. Yep. Probably in another week or so, we'll have to go in the hedge a second time. As far as fruit load, um, we we just have to see what's set on there, and then we'll drop green. We'll we'll drop fruit early, and then we'll come back probably and do a green harvest. If we see certain bunches are not maturing right, we'll drop them off. So we always evaluate our crop load to our canopy. You know the, how good our canopy is, and but yields are probably three ton. You know, we keep most of our yields around three. If the canopy's beautiful and the and the vintage looks like it, the the, the growing season is great. We, we might be able to bump it up a little bit, um, but that's uh, yeah. I, I drop fruit. Otherwise, we'd have you know a higher yield. So we definitely drop fruit. Yeah. Like Jim said, I've only, I've only hedged once, and I can tell you, I've got Chardonnay here and uh, the um, San Marco right next to it, and I got to go through and hedge that Chardonnay again because it's just falling over the road. But at this point in time, anyway, the San Marco is growing straight. I mean, it's really looking nice. In the beginning of the year, it tends to grow sideways like Syrah, and you got to push it up. But it's kind of neat because you push it up and you see all these clusters coming down of the newly formed fruit. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's actually, well, it's more labor intensive, but it's better if you have a, a variety that sets more fruit than you want, because it'll slow the vegetative growth down yeah, for you. Yeah. And okay. then you come back in and drop the fruit to the load you want. That's okay. my Chardonnay. Yep. There, there's only so much energy that that vine has, and the more fruit it has, it's got to divvy up that, divvy that up. And then you go back and you green drop it, and then it goes... To where you want it to go. Mm -hmm. it, it's not as if it's been easy going growing it because there have been some setbacks that are almost not setbacks, but they've they've hampered our ability to grow it. One is that in 2020, the year of the virus for everybody, it was also discovered that Pinot Green virus was lurking in 80% of our San Marco. And oh. um, we contacted uh, Marco Stefanini and the Italians, and they said, it's not a big deal. It doesn't affect the vine. So, and we tested ours, and yeah, 80% had it. But symptoms of it, when it actually does affect the vine, are stippling of the leaves, weakening of growth. But it affects ultimately the production level and the sugar level. We've tested year after year for five years now, and there's absolutely no difference between or four years, uh, no difference between those that are affected by the sand, by the Pinot Gris virus and those that are, are not affected by it. They, 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 so they this Pinot exactly. Gris virus, does it normally just attack Pinot Gris? Is that why it's called that? I think, I think it must yeah. be expressed more in Pinot it's Gris. A, yeah, it's expressed more in Pinot Gris. Um, it, not that it, it was only in a San Marco. I mean, uh, UC it's Davis true. had a clean, had to redo their whole clean uh, plant block because they found this virus in there. That's the problem when you find, when you, when you can detect a new virus, you're going to find it probably all over the place. That's right. They didn't, they didn't come out with this until 2013 for the test for it. Uh, and then we didn't hear about it until 2020, I guess. But the Do you think maybe period, that the virus was when it was in quarantine, it was caught when it was in quarantine in California? It, no, they did not find it because there was no test for it at that time. Okay. They, did, they weren't testing for it. And now the, the Italians don't even test for it because he said, at least not in San Marco. They said, this does not affect San Marco production. And as far as we're concerned, it doesn't affect San Marco production. There okay. are some people who have Pinot Gris planted next to San Marco that are concerned. We have it. It hasn't jumped. But And then uh, then I don't even know if we have the vector that could transmit it from one vine to the other here. Right. You know, it's mm -hmm. like like Pierce disease, or what do you have out there? The sharpshooter. Sharpshooter. Yeah. 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 It's like, so we don't have that here. Um, yeah, that sharpshooter yeah. is getting out of control. Yeah. But it's it's traveling also. You're, it's being found in more, more and more places. So. Yeah. Yeah. 
So uh, that's interesting because, I mean, we don't have Pinot Gris, uh, so I didn't even know there was a Pinot Gris virus. I didn't so, either. That was new to me, too. But I, I guess there can be a virus for anything, and, you know, you just hope it doesn't it doesn't jump. So did, did you say your Chardonnay does have it and it doesn't affect the Chardonnay either? No. Uh, it, it, it's yeah, also it in Trentina. Mm -hmm. Trentina is our white variety that's a cross of Mus, Muscat Alessandria and a Malvasia. And oh. that's another grape that we brought over. When you get back to M's again, I mean, uh, T's, We'll have to do Trentina for you because it's a really nice floral grape. Sounds, sounds good. We'll hold you up to it. Yeah. But that has it. Uh, it's a white grape, and it is not affected by the virus, even though over 90% of those have it. And one of the things I should mention is you have to remember that Trentina Alto Adige is a big-time grower of Pinot Grigio. That's right. Santa Margarita. That, so it actually yeah. originated there. That's where they first found this virus. Okay. Wow. So, yeah. yeah, it definitely came over with the cuttings and it just yes. wasn't. Yes, yes. You know, it might have been dormant and then it. You well, know. I want to clarify that. I don't think it wasn't isolated only in the San Marco. They found this Pinot Gris virus in the majority of the varieties they, had, they were growing there. So it didn't, it's don't, uh, we're not going to take credit for importing that. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't mean that. I'm sorry. I didn't yeah. mean that. I didn't yeah. mean that. No. I, meant, I meant that they didn't know to test for it when it came over. That is it, correct. But, that is exactly right. So, you know, if you don't know what you're looking for, you're not finding, you're not finding anything, yeah. you know. And it, if a plant's not showing any symptoms, you're not looking for anything. Exactly. Right. Right. And we, we can't talk about anything because we had the big Graciano goof here in Paso. You know, everybody was growing uh, Moved and it was Graciano, you know. Uh, they don't even look alike. So I, you know, I mean, you know. so, uh, so we, we can't, you know, stick our necks out into anything. So. <laughs> We're also looking for a wine that's of Italian origin that grows well in this region. We grow Sangiovese, it does okay if you have the right clone. We grow some Barbera and some Nebbiolo, they grow okay, but not every year. So this is something I think could produce well for us every year. I mean, mm -hmm. this is really a nice wine. And, and that's that's a very important to us, consistency. Right. You know, some varieties might give you a beautiful wine two out of five years. Well, that's just not good enough. You know, it's, right. it's just not good enough. So. Right. What what do you think you would pair this wine with, food food wise? Uh, what what it would pair well with? Yeah, I would. I you're asking probably not the right guy because if the wine tastes good and the food tastes good and they you know they are like on the same level spice wise mm -hmm. and everything, I would say this is very versatile. And uh, I think so being, too. Being of Italian heritage, you know, I'm a little prejudiced. To, Italian wines normally have the bright acidity to go with just about any food. Um, so I don't know if I'd be interested to hear what you think it would go with. I'm thinking this would go well. This would go well with uh, pasta, spaghetti, and meatballs, Sunday gravy, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking meatloaf. And now a word from our sponsor. Looking to be in the know about Dracaena wines? Want to be the first to know about our new releases and special offers? All you need to do is sign up for our newsletter. There is no commitment necessary, and I promise you we won't spam your mailbox with loads of messages. Need another reason to sign up? Quite possibly the best reason? You'll immediately get a discount code for 10% off your first purchase and be privy to newsletter-only discounts. Let Dracaena Wines turn your moments into great memories. Visit our website, www.dracaenawines.com, or use the link in show notes to sign up. It will take you less than a minute, but the rewards will last a lifetime. Yeah, I, I'm thinking like, and Debbie's going to laugh because I don't eat this stuff, but I'm thinking like a crusted, like tenderloin, something, um, what what's the thing that you wrap the meat? You know. Um, oh, in the puff pastry. In the puff yeah. pastry. Yeah. Oh. It right. is. Um, I do this all the time. Uh, yeah. Um, 
but that, that's what I'm so that's what I'm I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. I can see it in. I can also see it in um, game. It's yeah. more the 2022 than the 21. But you know what, Laura, you appreciate this. I can see this in a bean dish. Like oh bean yeah, tacos, um, mm -hmm. stuff like that, like black beans. I guess, yeah. I guess that a we, lot of things. Yeah, we could say, well, what what would we not serve this with? There well, you go. Flounder. I don't think I, don't I serve, think with serve this with, with fish. <laughs> Yeah, like a, a salmon, probably. Salmon, salmon you probably could get away with, but any white fish, I think it would be too overpowering. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Something fatty. I actually think yeah. porchetta, a nice yes. porchetta would be wonderful. Yes, I think I so, I don't too. even know what that is. It, it's, well, it's pork. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think roasted pork. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Vegetarian here. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> when, when you throw out the fancy names of meat, I don't know what they are. <laughs> um, yeah, so there is there there is a, um, a as I'm drinking them both, there is a there's a distinctiveness between the two, the 21 and the 22, and it's it's just even the nose is 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 different um yeah i think the 22 you have more uh herbal notes more spicy yeah. notes mm -hmm. where the 21 is definitely black cherry yeah i get it as it's opening up a little more i'm also getting like a, a licorice like a in black the 20, in the 20 20 in, in the, the 21, 21. And you can just you can definitely tell though the twenty two is so much is much a younger wine. It's more it's it's a little bit I don't want to say lighter, but it's just mm. you can definitely tell it's younger and the twenty one is a little bit more mature. Yeah, the tannins the tannins are, are a bit rippier in the in the twenty two. It's younger, but I if you to me if you get past that that grippiness. I get more fruit in the 2022 than the 2021. I think, um, I mean, I, I'm actually loving, I'm loving them both, but uh, my, my style, I'm gearing more towards that 22. Uh, yeah, 20, 22 was really a great growing season. It was a very special vintage. Yeah. yeah. I joke uh, in the tasting room, I tell people when I serve our 2022, uh, Shannon Blanc, I tell them that she, Mother Nature was was saying, I'm sorry for 20 and 21, um, that you know, she gave us two vintages that, you know, we're all pulling our hair out as winemakers between, um, for us, all of the fires in 2020, and then an 18-day heat spike over 105 degrees at the worst time in 2021. So I was like, she finally said in 2022, I'm sorry, here's a nice vintage for you. <laughs> Um, on your website, you actually are, you, you mentioned on the website, uh, uh, phenolics and anthocyanins, and we get some people who listen to uh, Deb's podcast and come on the webinar who are trying to learn the terminology of winemaking and what it is. So can you please explain um, why you call those two out for San Marco and what you think like, how would you explain that to our listeners? Uh, actually, the Foundation Edmund Mock, where Marco Stefanini works, profiles their wines very nicely, uh, looking at the uh, phenolics and anthocyanins in particular. Um, anthocyanins are really the main contributor to the color. And phenolics and anthocyanins are both antioxidants. So that's why a lot of people concentrate on on that. Okay, thank you. So go ahead, Lori. Oh, I'm sorry, I did that backwards. Okay. Um, so uh, the other thing is you had mentioned that it's not called San Marco in Italy. Yes. And uh, so there's quite a few regions that have had grape varieties that were named as the region itself, as a, as a city or whatever. So like Rhea Spicious and Alberino 
and Glera and Prosecco. And when the EU came in, they're like, nope, 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 can't do that. So do you think that that's why it's not called San Marco? There? Well, and there's several reasons why you can't call it San Marco in Italy. One, although the researcher's name is Marco, you cannot name a wine after with the first name of a person in Italy. That's what I've been told, which is crazy. Oh, okay. That's interesting. You can't use that. Second, there is already a winery in Italy called San Marco Winery. So I guess there would have been a conflict with that as okay. well. Um, so what they call it now is Echo, E-C-O, which is like ecologic. And then uh, Iasma is the Italian word for the foundation Edmund Mock. It's Instituto Agrario San Miguel Al Adige. And then, <laughs> then they have a number after it, one. That was the first one of these that they're producing. Uh, we actually asked them to develop a name for this first. And they were gonna have a contest amongst their students, et cetera. It just didn't happen. And after three years, we said, we're ready to sell this stuff. You know, you don't have a name. He said, just name it what you want to. So, I mean, we, we had to go through the, um, what, what, what did we go through, Jim? We had to get it proprietary, as a proprietary name, and then we had to get it registered. This is a registered name. It's a yeah. real great. It's a registered bridal name. Uh -huh. Yeah. I think yeah. we didn't have that for the first bottle, so we just used San Marco as a fanciful name on the label. But then we went through the process. You know, you had to show how many acres were grown and that it's, you know, it's, it's been produced commercially. And then they accepted San Marco as the rival name. So it's registered now. Anybody that grows wow, San Marco. you guys are the, the founders of it then here. Yeah. In the States. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know what would be awesome. funny? If the Italians call it San Marco because it's registered in the United States as San Marco. Yeah. <laughs> that would be really funny. I don't know if they could do that. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. But the name thing is interesting. Sorry, the name thing is interesting because, um, you know, Darif was named after the the person who created Darif, which is um, and the Americans changed it. They didn't want it to be Darif, so they named it to Petit Syrah, which I think is the stupidest thing on the face of the earth because now everybody thinks it's just small berries of Syrah. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, but that's interesting that you can't, you know, the, you know, that's the wine, the wine makes sense, I guess. That's but, what I was told. They were very envious, envious that we could just name it like this. <laughs> United States, the wild, wild west of the wine making world. Yeah. What do you think the aging potential is of the San Marco wine? I think it's great. I, I really do. From, from what Marco said, if you could age it in oak for a year and a half or two, It'll last for a while, and for me, with all the phenolics and the tannins in it, mm -hmm. I think it has great potential. I would say ten years is just start, just starting to get it to where you really want it. I mean, almost all the reds we grow here have showed such aging potential. It's it's something else. We have our our library, our cellar that we keep a library in, and we'll pull bottles out that are fifteen years old. And that's actually when we were, you know, the vineyards were young, we were young, or, you know, our processing was young, but the wines are just, they're showing great potential. So, Chambersan in particular ages extremely well. It's really so much better and after that, it has to It's too early to, to tell how it's going to develop over time, you know, but it will be really interesting. I'll have to, you know, God willing, I'm still around in 10 years, I'll have to come up and taste. Yeah, we'll have it. <laughs> Because we put wine away every year, so you can have it. Yeah, we'll have to do a tasting of this is then and this is now, and you know, see what happens. Mm -hmm. We got to get some sommeliers interested in this variety. Since, well, what do you think about it? How do you? How, how I do like you it. Know? I think it's a very versatile wine. I, I, you know, I tasted it, you know, back when I was there in 2020 and, and everything, and and I was, and I mean, and you know, I was like, oh, this is interesting, but. It's really well developed. It's it's got nice structure. It's it's really got nice fruit. It, I think it I think it's a good food wine. I I really I really love it. I I, I think um, I I want to pour my like I say right now it's quarter to eleven in the morning, but um, I want to pour myself a glass and later tonight and let the glass sit. For a bit um and 
and see how it develops, you know, or how, how it evolves as it, as it opens up the, the 20, the 2022 is still kind of, it's getting there, but the 2021 has changed since I, since I opened it, you know, since I poured the glass and I, I really do. I'm loving it. It's such, um, I mean, I, I get kind of more, more of a food thing, but I'm not really drinking this by itself. But it's also, it's not, it's not a heavy, like a seven, uh, Cabernet yeah. seven. It's, right. or, or even a Merlot. Um, it's, it, it's just enjoyable. It's, mm -hmm. He, yeah, most people call it medium, medium body. Yeah, the acidity. No, it's a good red for summer. You know, where you know you're looking for a good red to go with, to go and pair with something, or just to sit and you know and sip on. You know, on I think it's a good red. Yeah. It, the, to me, the acidity is so bright, like it, it's it's salivating. You know, mm -hmm. it is. It makes you want to come back and. It's not it not that not saying the acidity is out of balance. It's right in there, and the tannins are bringing are bringing you know that acidity back in line. It. Well, that's but, what it's been, that's what it's been showing in the video. Like when we we bring it in between one twenty one and twenty three bricks. Okay. We use the numbers more just to know how we handle the the fruit in in the winery. It's mostly by taste and how the fruit looks and how long we can let it think it can just get better out there. But that the uh, acids are normally six, the TA is normally six or better, which is oh. great when you have that natural acidity in there. You know, you can always bump up the acidity, but it's really nice when it has its own acidity to start. And is that the, is the 20, oh, wait, I don't have it. Is, it, is the, is that the average um, alcohol, that 12, 12, three, is that the average alcohol? Yeah, almost. That's pretty average for all our wines. And I can see this one, you know, we, we, if we pick something that's 24 bricks, that's normally farther than we want it to go. We normally have good maturity before then. Um, and then a lot of times, the majority of times our seasons don't allow the sugars to get up that high. Um, Cause what we also have to watch is the acids start falling out. You know, your pHs are going up. So, you know, we kind of look for that balance. And it's like California wines in the 70s and 80s. <laughs> they're 12 and a half percent. Yeah, yeah. The, the trend is starting to the trend is starting to go back. Yeah, uh, it, it is. Uh, there's there's a winery that I shall remain nameless um, that we used to call a headache in a bottle. <laughs> it was like 17 labeled as 17 percent alcohol. Um, yeah. Uh, now, other than the fact that, my gosh, you're the people who brought this in, you're the people who named it, you are the fathers of San Marco, what's your favorite thing about working with San Marco? Uh, well, for, for me, it pretty much grows on its own, um, and the disease resistance, the, the sustainability is really going to be the future. We need varieties that you don't have to use so much material in the in the in the vineyard uh you know you lose materials left and right so the vine really has to be able to take care of itself and the disease resistance is number one for in the vineyard uh the fruit load always looks good the way the fruit hangs you know that looseness and then starting from day one it's been a dream to make the wine like we haven't really had to do anything to it you know some wines you got to make sure you put it in the right oak you got to make sure you do certain things to it to make it really come around so far this one's been doing it all on its own for me it, jim mentioned all the things and i would emphasize the fruit because it's one of those few fruits where you've got oblong berries that are not touching each other so there's plenty of air circulating. It's one of the reasons they're more disease resistant and they're pretty big size. So if you just look down the row and you see these clusters just uh, hanging, it's really beautiful, beautiful grape. So, you know, there's other wineries that are growing in the San Marco. Did they reach out to you? To they reached out usually to talk about, you know, planting it, et cetera. 
I'd like to hear a little bit more from them about how they're doing. And I plan to contact them. And uh, one of them in, is in North Carolina, Ralph Aldini, and he concentrates on Italian varieties. And they even use the passamento technique. Uh, oh, many, I don't know that they're going to need it for this, but they use it for many of theirs. And they're doing a great job. And I think this will fit well in their portfolio. And we plan to have add this to our Pinot Grigio and our what else do we have, Jim? Uh, Franconia. Uh, Franconia. <laughs> okay. And uh, so, yeah, we'll have our Pinot Grigio, Franconia, um, San, Marco and Trentina. San Marco and Trentina. So we'll have our own little Italian line. <laughs> Italian so if, if there's any winemakers or vineyard managers that are interested in possibly growing San Marco, should they reach out to you? Uh, they can, they can, it's, it's a good way, you know, so we can educate them in any way they need it, but then we would uh, pass them on to the double uh, A vineyard. It's, that's where they would buy the vines. Okay. And the double A vineyard normally checks with us, like how many vines do you think we should propagate this year, you know, for next year. Mm -hmm. So the better handle we have on who's looking for uh, the grape to plant, the better we can direct double um, A as to how many Vines to propagate. Right. They're located in New York State. They have a beautiful website. And I, where is that vineyard in New York? Fredonia, New York. Oh, that's cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they don't grow the grape there. Okay. Well, no. <laughs> no, they they propagate. They do the the grafting. They're, for they're, they're the nursery. The, yeah, the, they they're a nurse. They're a big. Uh, well, they grow a lot of Concord, you know, in that region. Uh -huh. I think they have three hundred acres of grape or more. But Ooh, they're a big, big nursery. Yeah, you should check them out. It's uh, anybody that grows grapes and that doesn't know about Double A, just their website alone has plenty of information on the, it. Yeah, on East Coast. Yeah, wow. So they should contact you to learn all about everything and then go and. and well, they can also buy the wine, although I'm not sure if I can see that. Oh, yeah, <laughs> well, of course. The wine's available for sale and we shipped over 30 states. So, you know, just check out our website. Uh, that's or great. Come visit even better. Yeah, and actually, this this is really nice. People should try it. It's it's you know, thinking out of the box, something new, and something that grows grows well with minimal intervention. Mm -hmm. I, I have to give kudos because I always think that the like you being brave enough to say. I want to bring this vine, you know, these vines over and I want to grow this and I'm going to be the first, we're going to be the first people to grow this and just go ahead and doing it. And then not only just doing it, but like kicking butt and taking names. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, thank you very much. One of the really nice things is Jim's family, at least on one side of the family is from this area. Yeah. Mine is from the oh, roots of really further nice. south, but. Yeah, I, you know, part of it is Larry, you know, his persistency, because there's a lot to make all this happen, you know, get the vines here, get them through quarantine, get them, you know, and uh, the other part is my background as a vegetable grower, you are always trying new varieties, new crops, new stuff, you know, that's probably why we got 20 different varieties here, and uh, not all of them are home runs, a lot of them. Right. Never made it to first base, so you have, to, <laughs> you have to be willing to take that, take that chance. And then, fortunately, some days you're rewarded. Some days yeah. you get that grand slam. Yeah. yeah, this this is pretty much a a grand slam. I mean, people need to know more about the grape. It's really thank you. Really nice. And yeah. so, um, Deb, go ahead. You got nineteen. Oh, what are your future plans for the grape and at the winery? Well, I would say I mean, this is going to be one of our, our premier variety varietals that will emphasize for people to taste and, you know, our uniqueness to getting it here and being producing it. Um, our dream always is to have less labels and less varieties that we're growing. But I think that's a dream. Because once you have something that's well, that's doing well, you, you're not going to pull it out. But right. th as I see it, this is going to be, this and the Trentina are, are going to be kind of our, uh, you know, our focus. Like people people talk about Bellevue. Oh, yeah, their wines are really good. But you got to try that San Marco and Trentina. 
Do you think you're going to make it your signature grape? That's possible. It's possible. Signature wine. I should say signature wine. Mm -hmm. We let the, the customers decide that, but I think from my point of view, it's definitely right up there. And, yeah. and we're also planning more. I mean, I have an acre and a half at Quia Vineyards. Bellevue has two and a half, three. Now, three. So, you know, we're pushing five acres, and that's that's a fair amount. Uh, we have, you know, 20 varieties or more, but we don't have a whole lot that are planted where we have five acres of a single variety planted. Those How many cases of the San Marco do you produce a year? How many cases? Let me see. Well, I might. It's going to be more, I can tell you that, right. because it's, we just uh, planted another couple of acres. It's probably, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. If we did four ton, it's, it's well, probably 300 cases. Okay. You know? Yeah. So, so you know, it's limited. So people really want to try this. They better get over and. and now would be a good time. Now would be a good is time. It, is it cool uh, in the tasting room when somebody comes in and you're like, okay, next I'm going to pour you San Marco? And then they have absolutely no clue what you're talking about. And then they taste it and they're like, oh, man. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Like just to, to see the faces of people the very first time they're tasting a brand new grape variety for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. one, of the things, one of the things you mentioned was that you, uh, you like Cote Ron wines. We've grown Syrah here. And it does very well, except it has a virus that really does affect it. And it gets red leaf disease after four or five years, and you oh. have to pull them out after 10 years. That is this, may be, this may be our new Syrah, you know? <laughs> I, think, I definitely think it's yeah. a, a home run here. Yeah, it is. Um, I, can, I can see it being being a Syrah um, replacement in the fact of how how it is, you know, how it's opening up in, in the glass. Mm -hmm. I can see it as being a Syrah. Um, and you could even still make a GSM and keep it the yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I like that. <laughs> well, before we let it go, we do treat these people for an hour because we know how busy you are. Um, do, it, do you have anything that we forgot to ask you that you want people to know about San Marco or about Bellevue? And please tell them how they can find you, what your website is, if you have social media, any of that stuff, let people know how where to find you. And also where you're located in Jersey. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, Bellevue Winery, we are actually in Landisville, New Jersey. So the easiest way to describe that is Philadelphia and Atlantic City. You draw a line and we're right in the center. Okay. And uh, we're, this is agricultural country here. You know, our farm's 150 acres, all vegetable farms around, fruits, uh, great. And now there's quite a few vineyards in the area. Our outer coastal plain, ABA, so we're fed, federally designated as a grape growing region. Uh, you said about people tasting uh, San Marco and having that surprise look. Well, it's been uh, 20 some years now, I've been pouring wines in the tasting room and New Jersey, you know, New Jersey, it's a winery, let's go there, why not? And then you can see when they taste that first wine, how it's like, ooh. This is pretty good, you know, <laughs> light up, you know. So that's a, that's been very re rewarding for me through the years. So you go to our website, Bellevue is B-E-L-L-V-I-E-W, winery.com, and check us out, and uh, we'd be more than happy to ship some San Marco out. We have a venue here for, you know, outdoor with, with uh, performances. We have indoor. We're sitting in a nice air-conditioned room that probably hits – Seats over 50, oh, 62 people. Um, there's an outdoor pagoda. It's very, very pleasant. Eventually, we might have a bed and breakfast next door. Oh, nice. So, we just keep so they can always have to drink San Marco at 10 a.m. also. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for joining us and educating us on the San Marco grape. It's been wonderful. And you got a good thing going here. 
Oh, yes, thank you. really do. It's and it's a success thank to you. you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah, have a great day. And thank you. Yes. Have, a have a good week. Have a great week. Cheers. Cheers. Coffee, banana, dark cream, sweet this has been another episode of Exploring the Wine Glass. Thanks for listening. If you have suggestions on what topics you would like me to discuss, please reach out on social media. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Exploring the Wine Glass. I am also on LinkedIn as Lori Hoyt Butt. Of course, you can always email me at exploringthewineglass at gmail.com and sign up for my newsletter at exploringthewineglass.com. If you enjoyed what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe to help others find me more easily. And most importantly, tell your wine-loving friends, because if you like the podcast, they will too. Podcast music is Wine by Kievitz. Until next week, slancha. Right now.